Welcome back to another episode with Bernadotto. Um, today we're going to be talking about some new uh, fundings, but before we get going, Michael, why don't you talk about uh, something we have for all of our Access Plus members coming up pretty soon. So with all the new laws that have come into place, we, the partners at Bernadotto, are hosting a Zoom call for our Access Plus members, and that is tomorrow, I'm sorry, Wednesday the 15th um, at 5 o'clock Central Time. And so hopefully you've got that invitation. You can reach out to Allison at Bernadotto or reach out to Brad or me and we can help get you what you need to join that call. I think it'll be informative and we'll even go a little deeper onto some of these lending programs that are available, including the ones we're about to talk about. All right, that's a perfect segue, Michael. We're going to talk about, you've already heard a lot of our different talks on the CARES Act and that when the CARES Act first came out, there's a ton of different laws that were part of it, sorry, programs, such as the PPP loans or the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Uh, to, today, we're going to discuss two other uh, sources uh, that we haven't really discussed, uh, but because there's so much information, we felt like um, these, then we would start discussing these two new funding sources that maybe some of our clients have already looked into or some of them have not. And Michael, maybe you can start off with the very first one, the Main Street Lending Program. The Main Street Lending Program came, it was approved uh, late last week. This actually came from the Federal Reserve as a means to unlock more funding to uh, support businesses during uh, COVID-19. The difference between this one and the other ones are that it seems to be geared more towards mid-size and larger businesses. And so the way this will work is the, the a borrower would apply to an FDIC bank to get funding from this. These are larger loans. And so the minimum that can be applied for is a million dollars. And that's up to 25 million. Each business, there's a formula for EBITDA, which could lower that maximum. But we're talking about a big loan, and these have to be paid back in 40 years. And so you're really looking at businesses that match that kind of funding and the ability to pay back over 40 years. The eligibility for it is up to 10,000 employees, and up to $2.5 billion in revenues. So you're talking, uh, you know, again, bigger businesses. It's hard to tell based on the early thoughts on this, whether it's going to be desirable for a lot of these businesses. The four-year payback seems to be, you know, a challenge for some businesses. And then, you know, there are restrictions kind of that came through on the CARES Act on stock repurchase, dividends, and compensation that will come into play with these larger businesses. And so it's too soon to know how desirable this will end up being or how good of a fit it'll be. But we are encouraging our larger clients with multiple locations to take a look at this because it, it really could bridge cash flow issues over you know this period where most of them are closed right now and, uh, and maybe even a little bit as you know, the economy gets ramped up again. Okay. And so that's another great funding program for you to consider. This next, so unlike the Main Street Lending Program that Michael just discussed, um, this next part is actually just for healthcare clients. And as part of the CARES Act, there was something called the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. Um, that particular fund was really for the benefit of the medical providers and even a limited number of those. It really was built for the, those medical providers who are in the front line treating uh, COVID-19 and that they needed help uh, with reimbursements or coverage that they weren't getting from either the, the federal government or from other payers. So initially the government said, hey, if you want these funds, you know, you have to be using these funds to help, you know, prevent or prepare or respond to coronavirus. Otherwise, we don't see a reason to reimburse you. And that, that was the way we had interpreted. And so obviously for a lot of our clients, that this was not something that they were interested in because they were not frontline troops, so they couldn't really access these funds. Everything kind of shifted uh, just last week. And, and like everything else that's happening right now, uh, the shifts ha are happening as fast as, to, as the laws passed and then how the administration then decides to pursue that law. And so that's what happened in this particular case is that 
at a press briefing last week at the White House press briefing, the administrator for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services said, you know what, you know, the president has urged us to uh, broadly interpret this law. And in doing so, um, we're going to start relieving these tranches out there to the medical providers. And one of the tranches, the very first one, the first $30 billion that we're going to release, we're going to see this as a no-strings-attached grant for all healthcare providers that receive these dollars. And they can essentially spend them any way they see fit. And so this was, again, the first tranche was only for Medicare providers. So if you happen to be a Medicare provider, all of a sudden you looked up and Medicare paid you um, some substantial funds. Because, again, it's based on how much uh, you typically bill for them. And a lot of you are looking at the law and says, well, I can't use these funds because I don't, I'm not going to be a frontline provider. And I'm not going to prepare for and change my business to start treating coronavirus. And that's where the confusion is. When you read the law, that's it's clear that you can't touch the funds. But the administration is now saying, no, 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 we want to help out our doctors no matter what. And in doing so, uh, you can have these funds and then use them any way you, you, you desire to use them. Now, the catch, of course, is we still don't have any perfect guidance yet from additional guidance yet from CMS on how if there's going to be any reporting requirements for this. Because they keep calling it a grant. Um, and if you have something else that you have to do for it. The other thing, of course, is that a lot of accountants are asking the same question, which is, well, is this going to be income that's be taxable to you because the government just gave you these funds? Uh, these are all the kind of questions that we'll start digging through. But so if you are a Medicare provider and all of a sudden, I don't know where you, you had funds, um, these are considered, again, no strings attached. And I use that loosely uh, because we don't know exactly all the strings, but it does appear that these some funds that you can use. We still don't know how the, you'll be the perception of, of what reporting requirements will be needed and how the IRS would be. So that's kind of the two main things that we were, we're looking at this week. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you have any other wrap-ups on this one. I would just encourage everyone, the government has given many different tools to try to help small businesses through this pandemic. And it's important to look at all of them and in some cases apply for more than one. I know many of our clients have applied both you know, for the disaster relief, SBA loan, and the PPP. Um, I know I didn't mention this earlier that uh, the Main Street uh, program, you can also apply for the PPP. Uh, so you can, you're eligible for both. And so it's worth looking. None of them are perfect. They all have issues and they all have uncertainties with them. But it's really important to look hard at this given the current background with the with the pandemic. Yep, that, I agree. Well, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. We look forward to speaking to you next time.